<clears throat> okay, well, here we are. We're live. Today is the 29th of May, 2020. And uh, this is the second time that I've had Robert Spencer on Fander Films. Good to have you here, Robert. Thanks for coming back. Great to be back, Jay. Thank you very much. And this time, you're going to be on the hot seat because we are okay. live. People are going to be asking questions. I've got a whole slew of questions here, about six pages of questions that have come through that I'm going to be asking you. Uh, just for those people who don't know who Robert Spencer is, I just want to introduce these two books. This is the one uh, that you came out, I think, in 2007. Am I correct? Six, but close enough. 2006, which um, <clears throat> try to understand... Muhammad from within the traditions, from the much later traditions, the uh, ninth and 10th century traditions. So you're looking from within the, uh, Islam to see what who Muhammad was and what he did and what he said. Then you came out with this book, uh, 2011, am I correct? Yeah, thereabouts, yeah. Which is from outside of the tradition, from a historical standpoint. And this is the book I'm really excited about, Robert, and that's why we had you on uh, about 10 days ago, to really unpack this book, because this is where we're heading here in Fander Films. We're looking at the historical Muhammad. We're looking at historical Islam. We're looking at anything that we can pinpoint from the seventh century that would give us any inkling as to who Muhammad was, if he existed, what if he did, what kind of man was he, if Islam existed, if there was a religion called Islam, I'm sorry, or people called Muslims, uh, if there was a place called Mecca, or if there was a book called the Quran. Those are the five things we're really zeroing in on. This book asks the question about Muhammad, and this is brilliant. Uh, I, it was a, a bestseller. A lot of people have read it. You can see in the comments many of the questions that came up. People were engaged with it. You were, you were in some ways pushing the boundaries when you wrote it you're still pushing the boundaries because no one really want to wants to ask this question so we're going to zero in on some of those who have want to now come back and respond to you concerning some of the things you said in our uh our interview uh, a week ago and also other areas that they would like your opinion on because they you're highly respected i, I was fascinated just going through the comments don't know if you had a chance to do that robert uh, from the just interview. briefly yeah you look at the comments you're, you're really highly you're highly liked and respected because of the, well, the thank you very much you've been at the forefront of this debate you're one of the few that has actually gone public put your face in the public arena and has asked the questions no one else dares ask should be asking but do not want to for fear of the repercussions <laughs> and, um, it's certainly true cowardice is everywhere these days everywhere pandemic <laughs> a much greater epidemic than the coronavirus Okay, and uh, some we may even get into that later on. What I want to do is to is to split this uh, uh, this Q and A into two sections. Uh, the one first that we're going to start off with are asking the questions that the the people who are looking at your uh, videos who have been on Jihad Watch. You are uh, you, the Jihad Watch is your uh, arena. Am I correct? Yes, that's right. Jihadwatch.org. Okay, and say, do you want to say anything about that, just so people know what that is? Jihad Watch is a daily news site about jihad activity of all kinds, violent and nonviolent, dawah as well, Islamic proselytizing, and uh, attempts to bring Sharia to non-Sharia states. It is updated many times daily uh, at jihadwatch.org, and I am the founder of it and the editor and the principal writer there, although we do have some uh, excellent writers uh, other than me. Uh, well, the excellent ones are all other than me. And uh, it's uh, the only site that actually covers jihad activity. Obviously, we don't get to all of it because there's so much of it. Most people don't realize how much of it there is. But it's the only site that I know of that even attempts to cover daily jihad activity in the United States and around the world. Okay, so that's something that you can go to jihadwatch.org. Feel free, and actually, are there? Can you write comments on that? Can people respond? To yes, that? yeah. There's a comment section on every uh, every news story, and most of the news stories come from open source material from the major news services. One of the services that we provide, actually, at Jihad Watch, is to break through the. Uh, obfuscation and dissimulation of the major news services in regard to these stories as a rule and show what's really happening in them. Okay. 
All right. So this is a this is a this is a great it's a great service to all of us. We we're not going to move into the uh, questions that people have brought up. Uh, I asked specifically for I went and put up a video maybe two days ago, uh, just to say just to zero in on on what we've been talking about on the seventh century on the historical problems with Islam, and so these are the first one. And uh, the first one, uh, I, as I said earlier, we're going to split this up into two arenas. One is asking the uh, answering the questions. And I'll be looking at the um, comments that are coming up. If there are any good questions uh, that I want to add to it, I may go ahead and add those to it. The, the other second part of it is I want to look at a video that was just put up about 10 days ago by Dr. Shabirati. Do you know Dr. Shabirati? Not personally, but I'm quite familiar with him. I've been uh, several times invited uh, to, uh, I have several times invited him to debate. He has never accepted my invitation uh, well, actually, uh, that's not true. There was one time he did. We were all set to debate in Canada, and then it was suddenly canceled, and he accused me of backing out, which I most assuredly did not do. I had been quite eager to debate him, and I don't know to this day why the event was canceled. Since then, I have tried several times to arrange a debate with Dr. Ali to no avail. We're going to have to do that. I think it'd be great to have the two of you working. And I, I, I really enjoy Dr. Shabanali. He's a good friend. I've debated him six times now. Uh, and it, it, he's one of the few that I find that it not only is congenial, he doesn't use ad hominem. He's very careful to keep to the subject. And he's one of the few that can almost answer on every subject. But a week ago, he put up a video that was quite controversial, uh, which I want to. You've now watched it. I sent it to you to look at. It's only 13 minutes long. And I'd like to get your opinion. I'd like to do some discussion on what he said and what he did not say. So we'll get that and do that in the second half. Let's go ahead and let's get right to these questions. Now, here's one from Fahim Khan. He says this. Is there any evidence for any of the four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, uh, historically outside of the traditions? If so, how would this affect any of the conclusions drawn in your book? Actually, there's evidence for their non-existence. It's once again silence, but the silence is exceedingly strange. Because as I said in our first meeting, the... Uh, Arab conquests are one thing that we know happened. There's abundant historical attestation for them. And they were, of course, uh, Abu Bakr unified Arabia and then fought the wars of apostasy and so on. And Umar, Uthman, and Ali extended Islam outside of Arabia all across North Africa and the Middle East. That's the story anyway, and Persia as well. And yet, in none of these conquests is there any record that any of them ever was there. And it's exceedingly strange if Umar was leading armies into Jerusalem. You take, for example, exactly that. There's a very famous story uh, of Umar entering Jerusalem and being welcomed by the patriarch of Jerusalem, Sophronius, who was essentially the primary governing official in Jerusalem because of the uh, collapse and defeat of the Byzantine Empire and uh, the per. per Per, what would you call it, the, the persistence, the continuing presence of the church there. And so Sophronius welcomes Umar and takes him around the city, and they go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and Umar invite, uh, Sophronius rather, invites him in to say a prayer, and Umar magnanimously refuses and says he will not go in and say a prayer in the church because then his followers would want it for a mosque, and he's going to leave it for the Christians. And this is often adduced even today as an early indication of Islamic tolerance and pluralism and magnanimity. Now, in reality, we have multiple writings of Sophronius, and not in one of them does he mention Umar. There is no indication that he was aware that this, in, this meeting ever took place. He never writes about it himself, although he writes extensively about the conquest. <laughs> and he, uh, the, the story itself we have no record of before the ninth century. So uh, here, I think, is a, is a very, very strong indication that there was no Umar and that he, like Muhammad himself in many ways, is a project of, uh, product of legendary development. Let's, let's go back to the Doctrine of Iacobi that we talked ten, uh, that I referred to 10 days ago. There is a reference in the Doctrine of Iacobi, 634 to 640, of a prophet who does come and who, does, who comes and invades Jerusalem. Would that, could that be Umar? Well, I suppose it could be, but Umar never claims to be a prophet in the canonical Islamic story. 
And so it would, it would require either that Umar was a, claiming to be a prophet or understood to be a prophet, or else that Muhammad was still alive and was leading the armies and Umar was invented later for various reasons. Uh, either way, this story doesn't hold up with, doesn't match with the canonical Islamic story. And then if you say, well, maybe the, the writer got it all mixed up himself, well, then it's no longer a reliable witness to anything anyway. So there's no way in which it works well for those who defend the canonical story of Muhammad. Okay, so what you're saying is Abu Bakr, now we would expect Abu Bakr to be written up because he only really ruled for two years. Umar ruled for 10 years. He was uh, the one that would have taken over Jerusalem if he was the one that is referred to in the doctrine of Jacobi. So Fronius doesn't refer to him. Uthman is the one that spreads the spreads right across North Africa. So certainly somewhere in North Africa, they should have known about his name. They he should was have. also. He went also the other direction, uh, over to the east, all the way over to Afghanistan. So by the end of his reign, from Tripoli in West Africa all the way to Afghanistan should be under his control. That's an awful lot of land. What you're telling me is that no one said anything about these, this man or these conquerors that had any reference to him by name? That's right. Uh, as far as I, I know, there is no mention, uh, no contemporary mention of any of the caliphs before Muawiyah. And okay. so that means that the Khalifa Rashidun, the rightly guided caliphs, are uh, very possibly, if not likely, legendary. Because if you think about that extraordinary expanse of conquest that you just delineated, it's 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 virtually inconceivable <laughs> that nobody's going to mention the great general who's behind it all. And yeah. then again, you have also the strange incongruity of the stories regarding Uthman. I believe I mentioned last time, if I didn't, I shouldn't have, that uh, Ab uh, Abdul Malik says he collected the Quran in a tradition that is preserved in Islamic sources. Why on earth would that tradition have been preserved, much less invented, if Uthman had collected the Quran as is generally taken for granted today? It's much more likely that Abdul Malik collected the Quran and that he retrojected his work into the life of Uthman, the mythical figure of Uthman, so as to give it uh, antiquity and authenticity. Uh, we're going to have to add a sixth column then to what we're looking at, not just Muhammad, not only Muslim Islam and the Mecca and the Quran. We're going to have to say, what about the rightly guided caliphs? So you're saying the Rushadun period, this whole idea, this golden period, remember, this is the golden period of Islam. This is what all the radicals want to get back to. They want to get back to that rightly guided period of the caliphs from 624 up to 661 which includes Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali. That whole era, you're now saying, you're now going public, that this did not exist. That's correct, yes. Okay. Now, as with Muhammad, it is likely that some of the elements of it are taken from actual events, although there is absolutely no way from the standpoint of the 21st century and the documentary evidence as it stands now to determine what is historically accurate and what is not. But it's likely that the stories of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, and Ali, as we have them, are uh, amalgamations of existing material, probably a mixture of historical and legendary elements. I'm going to put something up here. Um, Shane Fisher asks this. Robert, what briefly are some the updates you would make to an expanded edition of the of Did Muhammad Exist? I don't remember you saying this in Did Muhammad Exist in that book. Would you then add this? this quoted, uh, quoted to an updated version? Yeah, I do uh, I, I do think that in there, I mean, it's been 10 years since I wrote it now, so my memory might be faulty. Uh, I have gone through it a bit in preparation for these, but haven't reread the whole thing. It feels kind of odd to read one's own book. But in any case, uh, <laughs> the I do believe that there is some indication of that in the book, but I certainly would bring it out to a more explicit degree and add in all the uh, tremendous research of Dan Gibson with which I was not familiar at the time I wrote the book and uh, still need to learn quite a bit about, but I am familiar with it in general about his work with the Qiblas and the uh, original site of the uh, origins of Islam, which I think meshes, coalesces very nicely with the material that I have in Did Muhammad Exist? about is, uh, Mecca being invented and the Arabian setting of uh, the entire revelation being put into it uh, as a secondary matter, 
but not okay. as a matter of historical fact. Also, some of the manuscripts that have been discovered uh, that were widely hailed as being indication of the early origins of Islam, widely hailed as being an indication that the Quran was authentically from the time of an authentic prophet or an authentic man, Muhammad, uh, I would show that actually the, the what we know about those manuscripts that have been discovered since I wrote the book actually shows that they were uh, they they likely predate Islam and are thus more indication that the Quran was fashioned out of existing material as Christoph Luxemburg and uh, Luling Gunther Luling have said and others that uh, the Quran is comes from Christian material and other material that was uh, drastically reworked to create a scripture for this new religion. Yeah, the Jewish Apocrypha writings, uh, Surah 4, uh, Surah 5, uh, 31 and 32, uh, chapter 21, verse 51 to 71, the story of Abraham, uh, chapter 27, uh, verses 17 to 44, the story of uh, Solomon and, and the Queen of Sheba and the Hoopoe bird, all of these can be traced. Well, I think uh, there are some cases where we can say anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the Quran can now be traced to other literature. But uh, you, you are familiar with the, the latest uh, radiocarbon dating of the Birmingham folio and the other folios. Are you familiar with what's going on there? Uh, what they've done with the Sana manuscript in the different four different laboratories? Uh, as the Sana manuscript, I thought, dated from the late seventh century. Is there something uh, newer than that in regard no, no, to... No, no, this is... Okay, we're gonna, that will be for another show for another time. We'll do just the Quran. I like to really... Uh, pick your mind on this one. Uh, but that's for another time. I don't want to bring it out now because we're going to segue over into what we really need to get into. Let's Could I the... just add one little note about that, though? Yeah, go Since ahead. Since you mentioned the Sana manuscript, it's worth, it's very important to note that it's a palimpsest. Yeah. That is, it's writing that is written over earlier writing. In the earlier writing, scholars seem to agree that both the new and the old material written on it is uh, Quranic which would go along very nicely with the idea that the Quran is a matter of edit editing and revision and the incorporation of disparate materials. This book came out last year, which uh, is, I think is the first one that's actually written, Asma Hilali, where she actually goes and unpacks the lower layer and the upper layer. And she looks at the 60 verses in the lower layer, uh, which are from the 7th century. The upper layer would be 705. Uh, uh, 38th century. But the 60 verses that you have in the lower layer have 70 manuscript variants from the upper layer, which means don't agree with the upper layer, nor do they agree with the Quran we have today. Now, her her conclusion is that that's just a product of nothing more than it's a school text. Uh, of course, that's almost laughable, and you can see a why she had text? to say that. School text means students who are just practicing. Yeah, but okay, so they're getting it all wrong. So we got the school text of the students who got an F. That's right. It's a school text okay. that, that that remained for seven, 1,400 years. That's the yes. one that is the only one that's preserved. All the other <laughs> ones, and they quoted the upper layer. Of course, can you then understand why? It, and, and so all scholars are having a, a, a are having a heyday with that because if you have a lower layer, which would be the earlier layer, that disagrees in 60 verses, 70 differences within those 60 verses. And we've got every one of them. If we had a time, I'd show you just how much they disagree, because not only are they, is it a different Quran, it's also a different theology that is incorporated between the two layers. Now, if you're saying that the upper layer could be 20, 30, 40 years later, you can see an, probably the first example of a nascent Quran being created and then being revised. So, I mean, I, exactly what you're saying. This is, this is devastating uh, for... Islam and of course for this idea of the Quran, but we're, let's get back to this next question because it segues into this uh, This is for Maximus Atlas What is the best way to approach historical Islam after reading its traditional sources? In other words, should we completely reject everything we read there as later fabricated redaction including what you've just talked about if they all talk about Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman and Ali and Yet now you're saying that those aren't even historical. What are we going to do with the historical traditions? What would you do with them Robert? Well, I don't think they have any value as historical traditions. So if you're uh, coming to them as a historian or doing historical investigation, then you have to acknowledge that there is nothing that uh, could possibly support the idea that all this 8th and ninth century literature is uh, accurate in regard to what happened in the early part of the 7th when there's this huge yawning gap between the two with no indication that the material existed during that time in any form, including oral. 
And so if, if your investigations are historical, then you've got to throw them all out. If, on the other hand, and this is why I wrote two different mm -hmm. books about this, the truth about Muhammad, and did Muhammad exist, excuse me, because uh, the if you're coming at it from the standpoint of understanding what Muslims believe, then you have to be very well familiar with what's in the Hadith and what's in the Sirah material about Muhammad and about the formation of early Islam. You don't have to think that it has any general historical value, but understand that Muslims believe it does. So if you want to understand what Muslims think today, then yes, you have to know all about all this. But like I said last time, uh, it's like knowing Macbeth. You can know all about what Macbeth said and did in Shakespeare's play, but no, everybody should regard that with extreme caution if they're thinking about it as some kind of historical text. Yeah. Here's a question from Alan Rule. Uh, it's on the screen there. Robert, have you read the writings of Theophanes, the <laughs> confessor in the early ninth century? How come he seems to narrate a traditional Islamic narrative? Yeah, I have read the writings of Theophanes, the confessor in the early ninth century, and I never got the impression that he had anything but access to material that was being formulated at that time. I mean, in other words, by the early ninth century, you can very well have the traditional Islamic narrative. If you'd gone back a hundred years, you have uh, St. John of Damascus, who speaks about having read the Quran and having read Surat al-Baqarah. Now, Surat al-Baqarah is the second chapter of the Quran. N nobody talks like that. In other words, nobody says, I read this book and also chapter two. <laughs> you, you see the problem. And yeah. so uh, St. John of Damascus very clearly suggests that the Quran had not been collected at his time in the form in which it exists today. But by the time of Theophanes, uh, whether or not the Quran existed in exactly the form in which it exists today, there was plenty of material and plenty of sources from which Theophanes could have received the traditional narrative that we all take for granted today as being the formulation of Islam. That is all except those who've looked into its historicity. Okay, here's another question. This is from Par, uh, Peter Shearer, who's been actually engaging with me quite a bit over the last few weeks uh, since your interview. And he says this, when you published Did Muhammad Exist, I suggested on Jihad Watch that you should have had a subtitle either from Muhammad to no Hamid in 14th century's flat, or <laughs> Islam is a non-profit, P-R-O-P-H-E-T organization. Perhaps your upcoming revision could incorporate one of these. Well, there's no doubt uh, that th those are those encapsulate some very important facts in this, and that is that there is very serious question as to whether Muhammad existed, and uh, that there's certainly uh, the traditional formulation by both Muslims and non-Muslims that Muhammad was a prophet of Allah, or Muhammad was a liar and a false prophet, or crazy man, or something of that kind that neither one is really what seems to have happened here. Okay. Uh, now we're going to go, and this is similar to what we've, and in, in some ways it's similar to what you've just said, but let's see what you're taking on this. There are three questions uh, that they're, they're all on the similar lines. Uh, one was by Dominic <laughs> Charles, the other one's by Gary Romain, and one is by no one. And they say this, what was the Jewish account of the Muslim Congress of Jerusalem in 637, 638? Was there a mention of a man called Muhammad? If uh, Coming back to what you were saying earlier, if the Jews were being f uh, defeated, why didn't they mention him? Well, Gary goes and says, what about the Byzantine Empire? The Eastern Roman Byzantine Empire, wouldn't they have kept records? Uh, and the Congress would have been recorded in detail if they moved right across North Africa and destroyed much of the Byzantine Empire at that time. If they're moving up into what is today Turkey and taking over and up into Syria, that was all Byzantine. Certainly somebody should have written about it. And then, of course, the last one was Roman Catholicism. It has been in existence since three, oh, it, it existed since 300 AD, spread to many countries. It is possible that written items about Islam or Muhammad have been saved in the Vatican archives. Where are they? Certainly, these people who are being defeated, Byzantines, Jewish, Roman Catholicism, uh, which would be the Byzantines, certainly they would have had some reference to this. Uh, it's kind of piggyback on what you had said about, uh, a little bit earlier. Well, I would expect, I mean, I've never been to the Vatican archives. I doubt I'll ever get in, but uh, I would, would expect... They let, would that they let you into Italy? They probably would let me into Italy, but probably not into the 
Vatican archives. I've been rather harshly critical of Pope Francis and his uh, stances toward Islam, but that's another story. Uh, in regard to the archives, uh, there are certainly very ancient material in them, and most of it is not public. Most of it has never been published. Uh, it would be a tremendous boon to early, the scholarship on early Islam were the Vatican to allow historians to go in and peruse that material. But, uh, well, I wouldn't hold my breath in that regard. As far as the Byzantine records go, official records of the Byzantine Empire were mostly destroyed when the empire itself was destroyed. Uh, actually, the anniversary was uh, is today, is it not? Today's May 29th, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, on Tuesday, yeah. May 29th, 1453, the... Uh, uh, Sultan Mehmet the Conqueror broke into Constantinople, and that was the end of the Byzantine Empire. And uh, the archives were scattered to the winds uh, for the most part, except for material that was able to be spirited out or had been copied by other people. And uh, so, so, what you're saying is, even if there was something, any references to this, it would have it's been gone. It's gone. It would have been destroyed but it has by to the be noted that Sophronius, the Patriarch of Jerusalem, we have plenty of his writings, as I have noted, and he speaks extensively about the conquest. He never mentions Muhammad. He never mentions the Quran. He never mentions Islam. He never mentions uh, that the people who had conquered the city had a new religion at all. Okay. And he had intimate contact with those who were conquering. Why <laughs> did he say anything? Yes. Why and how, did, according to Richard Calculus D, he asks this, why and how did it take about 14 centuries for humanity to be ready to face Islam head on, again, looking at the evil therein? All its sources have always been there, although now we can dig deep and spread it in a lightning speed. So why has it taken us 14 years to be saying what you're saying now? Well, a lot of it has to do with the spread of modern technology that it's very simple now for me to talk to Dr. Smith and to uh, understand his uh, perspectives on these things and to watch his videos and to read the writings of uh, various people who have discussed these issues. It's far easier nowadays than it ever was, but it's not just a modern thing. I have uh, on the shelves back behind me somewhere, uh, I don't think they're in, it's in view, but I do have a copy of a book uh, by a gentleman called named Humphrey Prideau, I believe his name is. It's an 18th century book. It's uh, the the edition I have is from I believe 1792, and uh, it, it's a very rare book. Obviously, it's called something. I I, I I'm sorry, my memory is uh, not too great on this because it's sitting on my shelf, but I have not uh, perused it for quite a few years. Uh, but it's something called something like the history of an imposter or something like that. And it's a uh, an exposition of the life of Muhammad and how he's a false prophet. Now, of course, Humphrey Prideau did not have access to the historical materials that we have. He, he, he did only and could only take at face value the uh, canonical texts of Islam. But he did not hesitate to criticize Islam at that time. We should also remember that the earliest English translations of the Quran by Sale and by others were written by polemicists, by Christians yeah. for the most yeah. part, who were trying to show their fellow Christians and other people in, in the West what Islam was all about so that they could proselytize in Islamic lands more effectively. So there, and there's always been a give and take. You go back and read the Crusades literature and uh, St. Louis of France, the king, uh, was it the ninth, I believe his number is? In any case, uh, he writes about his own give and take with various Muslim authorities in the 13th yeah. century. And of course, there's the famous visit of St. Francis of Assisi to the Sultan, where he offers to set himself on fire to show if they offers that they both set themselves on fire to show whose is the true God, and so on and so on. Uh, obviously, we would not go about trying to determine the truth in those ways today, but this has always been, in other words, a, an inquiry. That's it, The History of Muhammad, The Great Imposter by Humphrey Prideaux. Very fine book that uh, I recommend if you can find one. 
Thank you, Mark. Uh, just to say a little bit more on that, there, there, uh, there, if you go through the whole history of the engagement between Islam and Christianity, you will see there is debate after debate after debate. The Al-Kindi, who is in the ninth century, who is in the courts of Mamun, who is the one of the first to actually remark at the fact that the Quran was still being compiled. Uh, of course, for, until until recently, we didn't know what he was talking about. Most people just dismissed him as being a, either a fool or an idiot, or just because he had an axe to grind. We now know that, that he was actually seeing it happen in his life time. Uh, uh, Dr. Carl Fander, the Fander Films that is named after him in the 1800s, one was one of the first uh, to take the Arabic text to go to the Hadith, to go to Al-Buhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, to go to Ibn Hisham on, on the Shira, to go to Al-Tabari and actually to translate it into German, into English so that we could read it. And then he would, got, he would engage in debates on this material, one of the first to debate it. And he was the first, to, one of the first to say uh, that, that Islam is, is, uh, is full of not only historical anachronisms, but Muhammad himself, he may he question whether or not the Muhammad of history is the Muhammad of faith. So these are great, uh, uh, terrific examples, starring examples of people who've gone before us. It's not just 1400 years later that we're not, that we're some, uh, creating something that's new. No, we're actually working on the backs of many who've gone ahead of us and done a terrific job and made our job a lot easier, as, as you have done, Robert, with your books, which will be used, I think, from centuries from now uh, for people to be able to use uh, in this in the engagement. Uh, Rajiv Abraham says this, what was the real motive behind the creation of Islam, in your opinion, probably after the collapse of the Roman Empire in AD 400? The power of vacuum was filled by the papacy, which acquired unbridled authority and ruled over the European monarchies. This possibly led to large-scale corruption, immorality, and exploitation, of which even the Arabs were victims. We know from history that this supreme authority of the papacy continued till it was put to an end by Napoleon Bonaparte. Was Islam, therefore, actually a response to the high handedness of the papacy? I think that uh, the chronology doesn't exactly work there. Uh, the papacy in the sense of the Bishop of Rome did exist. Actually, I just finished a book uh, that has nothing to do with Islam called The uh, Pope and the Church, The Case for Orthodoxy. I'm an Orthodox Christian myself, and uh, it's a criticism of the idea that the Pope in the first millennium exercised anything like the power that he wields in the Catholic Church today. And it's only starting in the ninth century and especially in the 11th, 12th, 13th that the Pope becomes as high-handed and uh, having exercising this unbridled authority. Uh, so I don't think that if you're talking about the foundation of Islam as a reaction to that, that it works because there was not the papacy as we know it in the Middle Ages at the time of the origins of Islam, even if one accepts the revisionist view regarding the formations of Islam that still begins it in the late seventh century, the early part of the eighth century with the uh, primary flowering of it coming in the ninth century, right around the time actually that uh, the papacy is really getting started on becoming the, the uh, what did you call it, high-handed and unbridled authority that it is or, or was for so many centuries. And so uh, it's, uh, it, it, I don't think that you can say, oh, and you know, in connection with that, I should note that uh, we should also mention in regard to the last question, St. John of Damascus mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, he is criticizing nascent Islam that clearly is not the Islam that we have today, even in the early part of the eighth century. Uh, and he was one of the first Islamocritics. But uh, that's uh, St. John of Damascus lived well before the uh, medieval papacy arose. Okay, terrific stuff. Now, we're going to, here's a segue a little bit over into something else. And this is from uh, Idir Ben Farat and also Mega Duta. Both ask you this question about Sunnism and Shiism. You often concentrate, Robert, on Sunni Islam, but not much on. Shia Islam, their version of Islam is even funnier. Is it because Shia do not idolize Muhammad the way Sunnis do? Uh, Megaduta says uh, the historicity of Haisha and the wars of apostasy and the schism in, between is in Islam between Sunni and Shia, which seems to suggest a coherent back history. How would you answer that? I mean, you, do you move, uh, first of all, do you spend all your time on Sunnism for a reason? Or what would you do? And of course, let me just put up a, 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 a ongoing question on this. If this is all 
Um, if this is something that is uh, that is fictional, then why do we even have a Sunni Shia divide? And where did it come from? Because this is a question I get asked all the time. How can you, because of the fact that there is they are they are so different uh, politically speaking, would that not suggest that they're historical? Well, sure. Two -pronged they question. are historical. There's no doubt about it. The question is how the split arose. Did it really arise between a rivalry and hatred between Aisha and Ali? Did it really arise because of a, uh, a disagreement over who should succeed Muhammad? Or were those stories invented in order to explain a split that arose for any number of other possible reasons, political rivalry, uh, ethnic differences between uh, the, 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 the people who comprised the two groups, any number of other things. They both have uh, cases that can be made from Muhammad's life. I mean, in other words, there are Sunni Hadith that have him appointing Ali as his successor in the Sunni Hadith collection. And the Sunni uh, apologists, of course, explain these away in various manners. But there's no doubt that uh, the Hadith, starting from the ninth century, they do have this material in them, which is exceedingly uncomfortable for Sunnis. At the same time, there is also material that militates against that, which only testifies to the likelihood that all of it was invented and that some of it was invented by one faction and some of it was invented by another faction. Uh, or else, if it's all authentic, then you have a very flighty, fickle, and indecisive individual in Muhammad, which uh, is unlikely given the fact, given the other material about him. But uh, I don't really uh, have a specific concentration on Sunni Islam. I wrote a book a few years back called The uh, Complete Infidel's Guide to Iran, which has material about the uh, origins of the Sunni Shiite split, uh, the origins that is as they are told in the canonical sources. And uh, a brief evaluation of their historicity, but uh, that's something I need to get into more. I, I tend to spend more time on the Sunnis because they are, after all, 85 to 90 percent of Muslims worldwide and are responsible when it comes to uh, Jihad Watch and my work on terrorism. It's the, the kind of terrorism that we see nowadays of people stabbing, spree, going on stabbing sprees in Paris and London and so on, and sh uh, mass shootings and so on, those are almost always, not 100 percent, but almost always committed by Sunnis. Uh, but uh, Shiite Islam, is, and there are important reasons for that that need to be brought out, and I do bring them out wherever uh, it's pertinent. But uh, certainly Shiite Islam is a, is a rich vein of uh, inquiry that should not be neglected, and I don't mean to uh, neglect it as such. The uh, history, when you're talking about the historicity of these things, though, they suffer from the same problem as all the rest of it, that there's just no indication that any of this existed before the ninth century. And so it's much more likely that it was invented to explain something rather than that it is the explanation itself. Okay, so there's a political rift that is happening, and this is trying. This is what it is explaining. Nothing more, nothing less. Yes. Okay. Uh, there are th uh, there are a number of questions, and I'm looking at the time, so I want to make sure that we keep moving on. There's a lot of questions coming up in the comments, but I'm trying. I would like to really keep to the questions that came to me in the last week. I asked people to write questions, so I'm giving priority to them over the ones on the side because many of them that are on the side are already asked here, and a number of the questions, uh, three of them that came up, uh, were about Gibson's material, which. You're not really familiar with, but let me answer them really quickly so that uh, so that uh, we do get them. Uh, Edgar Morina wants to know what are the mosques that are facing that are not uh, facing Mecca, and any of the mosques. That, let's see, Dan, uh, Dan Gibson uh, went to over a hundred of these mosques. He's the only one to have gone to these mosques. David King, the one that who is confronting him, only went to one mosque, and yet he's the world authority on the Qibla. How can you be a world authority on the Qibla and only gone to physically to one mosque? Dan Gibson is not the world authority on the Qibla. He's gone to over 100 and actually did the work of action, of going and finding the coordinates for every one of those Qiblas, personally doing that. They, he's still doing that. He still found another 15 in the last year. So this the idea that there was the, that these Qiblas are not facing in one direction is absolutely fallacious. 
Dan Gibson shows that every one of these Kiblas up until 706 are directly facing Petra. And these include the one in Medina, the one in Guangzhou, thousands of miles away. They're in China, the Sherman Mosque in Kerala in southern India. Uh, they're in Syria. They're in Egypt. They're in Israel. They're in Jordan. They're in Yemen. All these mosques up until 76 are uniquely facing Petra, and they're within two degrees off. Even as far away as China, they're within two degrees off. When you look at the mosques that finally start to face Mecca, that's not till 727. The first mosque that's facing Mecca is not till 727. The Qibla was canonized in 624. So we're talking over 100 years later. You get the first mosque that's facing Mecca. And when you look at the mosques that then continue to face Mecca, they are between four to five degrees off. They're twice as uh, uh, as much in error as those face that are the earlier ones that are facing <clears throat> Petra. So you see, David King and those who are confronting Dan Gibson have not answered that question. Uh, another question that came up uh, is this uh, Masjid al-Haram that's found uh, that was built in the year 697, 698. Are you familiar with this this inscription, uh, Robert? Do you know anything about this inscription? Uh, that the that the Kaab, the Masjid al-Haram was built or was it rebuilt? According to the inscription, uh, look at the date. You can see it's late 7th century, 698, and it's being built for the first time in Mecca, which suggests that this is, as far as those who wrote that inscription, this is the first Qibla, this is the first masjid that they know of. Masjid al-Haram would be what where the Kaaba is today. Now, uh, to me, that's hugely, that's hugely problematic for Muslims. Unless, of course, the dates are wrong. And, of course, maybe someone didn't know what they were writing on inscriptions. But the, just the date, and Sneakers Corner asked this, I would agree that this suggests that there was a first building. This was forced for that, that place. But there, as Gibson has found, every one of the five stages of the Hajj that you can go to today can be found in Petra, including the Marwa and Safa uh, hills that you go back and forth from, including the Kaaba has been found. Even the dimensions of the Kaaba that are there in Petra fit exactly with the traditional dimensions of the Kaaba. You can also see uh, that the Jamarat, that's the place where they throw the stones at, the, the Jamarat has been found. It's, 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 uh, and when you realize that all of these are pre-Islamic, that they are Nabataean, that they are there in Petra, and that's why all the mosques are facing Petra, up until the 8th century, the early 8th century, well, let's just say 727, it stands to reason then that almost all of these mosques and these uh, that are found, and one of the questions that came up from Tom Barnett is, what about this mosque way over in China? What are these mosques doing that far away? Well, the answer to that is the Nabataeans. Look and see who they are. And this is something that we're, we need to do a whole study on. The Nabataeans, and this is where Dan Gibson, his book is back here on the Nabataeans. When you look and see who they are, they are the merchants. They are the only ones that could cross the desert. They are the only ones that made it all the way to China because they use the stars for uh, their navigation. They did not use mathematics like the later Meccans, uh, the Meccan, the, the ones who came in the 9th and 10th century, the Oriental uh, uh, Muslims. They used mathematics and got it wrong. And yet these Nabataeans, wherever they went, they built these temples. They, they called them masjid because that's what it means, a place to bow. But they were all bowing towards Petra, which would be their sanctuary. It, it, uh, it's a no-brainer when you stop and look and see how simple this is. Uh, people have been having, uh, creating masjids for centuries, long before Islam came into existence. Now, once the Muslims took over those masjids, they called them mosques, they were still facing Petra, and they're still facing Petra today. They never destroyed them. They just kept them as they were, which is a crying shame for Muslims because there's the evidence. All we're doing is looking at the rocks, and if we're not going to cry out, the rocks will cry out for us. God bless them uh, that they're able to do that. So I think for uh, Tom, I mean, that's a great question, but I would suggest a lot of this has to do with the Nabataeans. Remember, it's the Nabataeans that give us the Arab script. It's the Nabataeans that give us the name of, of Allah, Ilaha. It's the Nabataeans that also the Quran is written in. The, the Arabic script that we see in the Quran comes from the Nabataeans. It does not come from the Hijaz much further south. Now, let's move into Muhammad. Uh, this is one of our favorite areas. This is what you wrote your book on. Uh, Sydney asked this question. Why did the Nicene Creed of 325 AD not reach Muhammad through the Christians, or did he choose to ignore it? So, this is similar to what uh, an earlier question you got. But why do you think, uh, if it, this is so early, why is it they did not know about this? It's, it's likely like that the Christians that Muhammad had to do with, or I should say the Christians that the people who formulated Islam 
had to do with were the ones in the area of not Arabia so much as uh, Iraq and Syria and uh, the area where, in other words, the heretics had gone. The Byzantine Empire uh, had uh, <clears throat> several ecumenical councils that are still recognized by uh, most of the Christian churches as being authoritative in which they defined various dogmas about the nature of Christ and the divinity of Christ and so on. And uh, the people who did not accept those decrees were uh, at a tremendous disadvantage in the society because Byzantine society was based around the, its unity as Christians, the unity of Christians. And so those who were considered to have broken that unity were not full citizens, were subject to various kinds of discrimination and harassment. They left the empire and went to the precise areas where Islam began formulating. So these are anti-Nicene, anti as well as anti-Nicene, that is pre-Nicene Christians, Christians who uh, don't accept the Council of Nicaea for the most part. And so uh, they're not going to be telling the people who formulated Islam about it. And the theology of Christianity that is reflected in the Quran uh, comes from those elements of Christianity that uh, the Gnostics, they did not kill or crucify him, but it appeared so unto them. Uh, there are Gnostic gospels where Jesus only seems to be crucified. He's a phantasm. Uh, the denial of the divinity of Christ, which is a development out of Nestorian Christianity, which denies that the uh, divine and the human Christ are, in it, are a unified person. And consequently, that can lead one to denying the divinity of Christ altogether, as well as Arianism, which also denies the divinity of Christ. You, you have all these people congregating around the precise areas where Islam is invented. Okay, so that's why it reflects that. That's a, that's a great point. I mean, that's a... Have you written this up? Is this, is this in one of your books? I don't think so, actually. That's something I should write. Because that influence, the enormous, I mean, this is what John Wansborough uh, referred to in his books in 1977 oh. and 78, the sectarian milieu and um, chronic <clears throat> geography. Uh, chronic, when he looked at that, uh, all the writings that were happening, he said, first of all, these writings only took a place much, much further north in places like Stesiphon. Uh, which is today Baghdad, and then those writings would not have existed that far south. But then he also said almost all of these writings reflect these sectarian groups that had been thrown out of the uh, thrown out of the Byzantine Empire. They were part of the diaspora. Those who were putting the Quran together in the eighth century, he was then making that big jump. This is in 1977. You realize that was a big jump at that time. Would have had access to this kind of material that stands to reason then that they were incorporating this material into this book that they were not putting together. We now know that John Wansburg was right, and he was correct. He was vilified at the time but it seems exactly what you're saying that they were this incorporating a lot of these ideas from these sectarian writers gnostic writers and all the rest so it stands to reason then why they even took on that theology uh, i they, think that some of this might be in did muhammad exist i do believe i mean this is something this is one of the first things incidentally that uh, if you'll pardon a personal note this is one of the first things I learned about Islam, actually, in the first paper i ever wrote in uh, on Islam when i was in college back in uh, I guess it was around 1981 or 83, was uh, about how the uh, Gnostic Gospels, particularly the Gospel of Thomas, influenced the Quranic view of, of Christ. And so uh, this is something that I think I put some things ab about it into Did Muhammad Exist, but it certainly bears a great deal more attention. Yeah, okay, terrific. Another book coming up, you'll see it uh, out next year. <laughs> Exxon Nikki says this, Muhammad's death is normally placed in 632, but the possibility that it should be placed two or three years later cannot be completely excluded. The Muslim calendar we instituted after Muhammad's death with the starting point of his immigration hijrah to Medina, then Yathrib, 10 years earlier. Some Muslims, however, seem to have correlated this point of origin with the year which came to the span 624-625 in the Gregorian calendar rather than the canonical year of 622. Where exactly is it written that he died in 632? Uh, and what about this above? Now, what I would like to uh, expand from that, another question that would go from that, and is how and why is 622 so important? You did refer to it briefly in the, uh, 10 days ago, but can you take this question and then expand as to what you think 
Robert, now sitting here in 2020, what would you say this 622 is so important? Why that year? And then why is it that the Muslims in the traditional account put his death to 632? Well, something happened in 622 that started the whole thing going. And I would expect that this date was fastened upon. I mean, this is, this is all speculation. And uh, you may be able to shed more light on this than I can. But uh, this is, of course, the traditional date for the Hydra. And the Hydra is the beginning, heralds the beginning of Muslims waging war against non-Muslims solely because they are non-Muslims. And so it would, ex I would expect that the historical reality, based on all the available evidence, is that the uh, Hydra was actually the beginning of Arabs starting to wage war to unify Arabia first and then to go out of Arabia starting in 632, and that's why that's, that date is chosen, in order to bring, uh, in order to establish their empire, which later became the linchpin for the formulation of Islam. So uh, these things seem to, I mean, especially the fact that the conquest started in 632, that seems to be borne out by the historical evidence that okay. uh, certainly we know from external sources that the Arabs started to conquer in the 630s. Uh, now, as far as did Muhammad really die in 632, there are plenty of it. I believe in, in answer to part of the question, Ibn Ishaq, if I recall correctly, uh, and you can correct me on this, Ibn Ishaq is the one who says it was 632. Right. And that's, of course, via Ibn Hisham and all that. And so that's very late, but there are quite a few other, and Ibn Warak has done some uh, excellent work on this. There are quite a few other traditions uh, within the Islamic literature that put Muhammad's dates at different times, 634, 630. It's interesting to note that uh, it may be that if he uh, died later, that he really did go into Syria or somebody really did go into Syria, as is mentioned in the Doctrina Yacobi. Uh, but that still would not give us the entirety of this uh, massive volume of Hadith literature t detailing every aspect of Muhammad's life. All right. Uh, uh, Scott Thong says this, I just wanted to say kudos to Mr. Spencer for mentioning what I call the amalgamation replacement theory on your show. Is this the theory you still hold personally today, whereby the figure of Muhammad as portrayed in the Islamic sources is an amalgamation of various existing Arabic folk tales, which explains many of the embarrassing or contradictory stories. We cannot find any trace of these sources today because the Arab oral legends died out when the written hadith were disseminated and all the original protagonists were replaced by Muhammad. As a contrast, we do have traces today of the other sources of the Islamic sources plagiarized from because these survived in written form, Christian sectarian apocrypha, Jewish midrashic tales, Sarasian writings, Alexander romance, etc., etc. Yeah, I'd say that that's uh, pretty much my view on all this, that... Uh, <clears throat> This there were several individuals. There were there was quite a bit of legendary material, and when Ab Abdul Malik and Hajjaj ibn Yusuf uh, determined that they needed a new religion to hold their new empire together, then they uh, looked to this material. It's only natural that they would have. There, there was nothing else unless they were going to make it up out of whole cloth. But to use the Arab uh, traditional materials was a very canny move because it was something that would be familiar with people to some degree. So the whole thing wouldn't appear to be a complete innovation. And of course, in the days before the internet and the days before newspapers, you could introduce slight variations into the material without people thinking that you are uh, going against something that has been received from their forefathers. It's just a... Uh, a part of it that they didn't hear in this village or whatever. Uh, and that uh, uh, there was another part of this, but unfortunately I don't have that question in front of me. There was another, I'm sorry, there was another part of this question I was going to address. No, he's um, going on. Well, he's saying that we have these traces and many other different writings. Uh, that would that Yeah, that's it. That the, uh, the, of course, the first written Arabic is pretty much the Quran. There's a little bit of material, a trickle of poetry and such before that, but there's not any kind of Arab liter Arabic literature to compare with Greek literature, Persian literature, and so on. And so we have all this material from the people the Muslims conquered and very little from them themselves. 
And that also goes into this area that we have all this material from these uh, non-Muslim sources showing how they were used in Islam, but uh, nothing from the Arabs because it wasn't written. Okay. Um, the next question has to do with the writings in the Dome of the Rock and the name Muhammad himself. Uh, Muhammad uh, is referred to in a number of different uh, references, uh, uh, but in the Dome of the Rock, you have the name that's finally introduced on the Dome of the Rock. It's introduced on the coins and it's introduced on the Caliph of Protocols. This is from Catholico, uh, Catholico uh, Forever, uh, one of your cohorts. Do you agree with Oleg? I don't know if you know Oleg from, from uh, France. Are you familiar with Oleg? I don't think so. Okay, he's a he's a friend. Uh, he's probably listening. I don't see his name up there, but he is has a number of uh, he has a number of great uh, uh, videos that he's put up there in France, all in French, unfortunately. And they are he starts from this premise that he's saying here that the title used for Muhammad in the mosque in Jerusalem, which is the tomb, tomb of the rock, and they refer to Jesus as the final messenger, but they refer to him as the praised one. Could that name be also named for, used for Jesus rather than? Uh, oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think the whole Dome of the Rock inscription is about Jesus. Uh, otherwise, you have to believe that the first line of it is about Muhammad, and then the subject is changed without notice, and the whole rest of it, line after line after line, how long is it? T uh, 10, 20 lines are all about Jesus. Yeah. It, doesn't, it doesn't really make any sense. Why would they uh, do that? If they want to write about uh, Jesus, then they're going to write about Jesus. And it's it's a non sequitur to introduce writing about G this writing about Jesus by mentioning Muhammad. If, on the other hand, the uh, Muhammad is a title for Jesus, then the whole thing becomes coherent, and it's unified as being a statement about Jesus, a statement of a creed that differs. In as a matter of fact, uh, speaking of some of the earlier one of the earlier questions, differs from the Nicene Creed and is probably formulated uh, as a specific response and rebuttal to it, such that uh, the Dome of the Rock inscription is a record of a heretical form of Christianity that uh, probably had left the Byzantine Empire and had built the Dome of the Rock as a Christian structure before it was taken over. Okay. Now, obviously, at the same time the Dome of the Rock is being built, he also introduces the coins, <clears throat> especially in 696 when he has those references. Uh, Surah 112, Surah 9 is there, where it is attacking the the begetness of God, neither does God beget, nor is he begotten. So it attacks the fatherhood of God. It attacks the sons of Jesus Christ. So on that case, uh, Muhammad is a name that it, you would, uh, that is part of the Shahada. There's only one God. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad mm -hmm. So you have that there. Would you say at that time in 696 that that is still referring to Jesus? Or would you say that is referring to a person? I would say that it's very likely that that's referring to Jesus as well. And that it's just all part of the denial of the divinity of Christ and the denial of various other aspects of Orthodox Christianity that the Abdul Malik and uh, Hajjaj were formulating their new religion uh, in contradistinction to. And so they wanted to say that uh, the, the, there's no God but Allah, and Jesus is not the Son of God, not the Savior, not Allah himself, but is just a messenger. All right. Well, then when would you place the reference to Muhammad as a person? When would you say that was introduced? Almost immediately after this. That, uh, of course, this is speculation. Uh, in the early part of the 8th century, John of Damascus, uh, some of the others who write at that time. Well, that's much uh, later. That's another That's another 30 years later. Where would you actually say, well, I mean, what, uh, what artifact are you looking at? Do you say, oh, the, you know, I'm not sure offhand, but aren't there some rock inscriptions at this point? Uh, this is something <laughs> I'm not really sure at okay. this time. Okay. The answer to your question. Uh, All right. That's for one. Come back to me on this. I'd like to know what you think Muhammad was then created. Well, I know I have this Muhammad. in the book, and so there is an answer to it. I apologize for not being able to produce it uh, from memory right now, but the fact is that it's right around this time that Muhammad starts getting going as an individual, I would suggest that even the fact that the of the Dome of the Rock inscription becomes part of the impetus for formulating Muhammad as a separate person. Okay. And um, that the, the, the beginning of Muhammad as an individual is in those inscriptions themselves. Not because, intended as such. No, not intended as such when they were formulated, but very quickly became such. 
All right. This is because people have brought this up that we disagree on this, and I do disagree with you on this one. But I'm sure I'm hearing what you're saying, Robert. I'll go with you. But I want to I want you to tell me when then he was created me, when he became the prophet. The, 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 the year 704 is coming into my mind, but I don't have uh, I, I do you re recall something for, uh, writing from 704? Well, the sauna is 705, so I'm not sure where 704 is. The mosques. I apologize. I have to go back and look at all this. Okay. This is something you're going to I expect an email from you and I expect an answer. In Absolutely. Reply. There we go. We've kept them on that. All right. Let's, let's move on. Uh, we, I want to move on real, real quickly to the Quran itself because this will be a good one to go right into what we're going to talk about. I see we're running out of time, but let's go ahead into these, <clears throat> these Quranic questions. So who is, do you think, the real author of the Quran? Was it compiled by committee from existing texts? How long did it take? This is a million-dollar question, and uh, you probably aren't going to be able to answer, but let, give it a try. Who do you think the author is? Well, that's, it would all be speculation, but it does seem as if Hajjaj ibn Yusuf is the uh, chief candidate, given the fact that I mentioned last like time. Who Hajjaj ibn Yusuf is. So he was the governor go. of Iraq and the lieutenant of Abdul Malik, the caliph, yeah. from 685 to 705. And the uh, there are traditions that I mentioned last time, uh, an old man saying, we never used to recite the Quran in the mosques until the time of Hajjaj ibn Yusuf. And uh, this is right around that time that you start to get Muhammad as an individual. So I, I do think that it was written by committee and that he was part of the committee. Yeah. He wasn't the only one in it. But it seems clear if you look at uh, Richard Bell's textual analysis of the Quran and whether you accept it or not, there's very strange things in the Quran. Uh, isn't it uh, Surah 74 that has uh, uh, above it or 19 and the long interpolation? I believe it's 7430. Uh, here again, I'm going from memory, but there are several of the uh, surahs, the early Meccan surahs, where it's very clear that there's interpolation, that there's uh, a, a set rhythm that has been set up, and the verses all have a uniform yeah. length. It's and then you are correct. Seventy-four. Yeah. Are you over it or nineteen. And then uh, a long interpolation that's clearly not in the same rhythm as the rest of it, and uh, is clearly brought in from somewhere else. And there are a lot of examples of that kind of thing in the Quran. Uh, indicating that it uh, is not likely to have been the work of one person. Okay, uh, and we're agreed on that point. Looks like there is a committee. It looks like mm -hmm. in the traditions, they're referring to the manuscript, the Quran of Dua, uh, Ubay Ibn Qab, who is uh, whose whose uh, manuscript became very popular up in Damascus. You have the uh, the manuscript of of uh, of yeah. Uh, uh, Al -Jaz, you have the one of Zaid ibn Tabit that became popular in Medina. So you have all these different ones that are became popular in different other cities who were, did not agree. Some had 116 surahs, some had 114, others had even fewer. And if that's in the traditions, you can see that this is this was something that was happening. Mm -hmm. Different committees that gave name to the different person who was the head of that committee seeming to be in contradiction to each other. Now, um, the next question is actually you answered earlier about the Sana'a mask in Yemen. Prove that there was an editing. This is by Duncan Thorburn. I think you answered that one uh, because of the fact that, that we do have the different layers. There is seems to be an editing process there. The, uh, two people have asked a question about Christoph Luxembourg. Are you familiar with his theories on his Syriac antecedents to the Quran? Are you familiar with that? Yeah, not only am I familiar with it, but that was one of my primary sources for did Muhammad exist? Uh, I don't claim to have any original thoughts. And uh, <laughs> I don't claim to have innovated anything in this area. All I wanted to do in Did Muhammad Exist was to bring the work of Luxembourg and Luling and uh, s uh, several others who have done groundbreaking research in this area to a more popular audience and to make them more widely known. And so I relied very heavily on the uh, Christoph Luxembourg's book, The Syro-Aramaic Reading of the Quran, uh, in Did Muhammad Exist? And I have tremendous respect for his scholarship. Okay. Well, that answers that question. So you do talk about Luxembourg. You do like his yeah. material. And it's very influential in even you writing this book, Did Muhammad Exist? Again, yeah. this is the book we're talking about. This is the book you've got to buy. If you don't have it on yourself, shame on you. Get it, put it on your shelf. You need to read it because a lot of what he's saying today are included in that book. We're going to segue now into something that, that I mentioned earlier, and that is Dr. Shabit Ali. Uh, you watch the video, 13 minutes long, <clears throat> where he seems to say, and I'm getting a lot of emails from everybody, that he seems to have finally admitted after all these years 
Now, Dr. Shabanali is highly respected. He is considered probably the best debater uh, in the Muslim world today, certainly the highest respected as far as academic, from an academic standpoint. Uh, Wiz has done numerous debates with many uh, influential people. I've had six debates with him. I don't think I'll ever have another debate with him. I don't think he'll debate me anymore because of what happened in 2014, six years ago. But in his video that he put up uh, uh, 10 days ago, he mentions that there are changes. Now, what are the changes that you hear what he said? What were the changes that he's referring to? Uh, can he's you help referring to, yeah, it was an extraordinary video, really, because he actually is the first Islamic spokesman I've ever seen to admit that there are variant readings of various Quran verses. And uh, I have to hand it to him at least, at very least for his honesty in admitting that yeah. when most Islamic apologists will simply flatly deny it in the face of all the evidence, as I know you're very well aware, and that uh, he seems to be genuinely grappling with the problem and trying to come up with an explanation for it. Uh, it seems as if it's... Uh, something he's worried about because yeah. of his multiple repetitions of the claims, the unsupported claims. But in the video, he makes many, many repeated declarations that these things don't have anything to do with Islamic doctrine or practice. Uh, they're just minor, minor, minor variations. Uh, it's very clear that he understands, even if he's not explicitly acknowledging, the explosive implications of what he's saying, since it's a foundation of Islamic apologetics in the 20th and 21st centuries that the Quran, unlike the Bible, has been miraculously preserved with no textual variation whatsoever, and that every manuscript agrees 100% with every other manuscript. There has nothing been lost, nothing added, nothing changed, nothing deleted, and that that is a sign of Allah's miraculous protection over the text. Uh, and, Shabir and, Ali has now retreated from that. It's, yeah. it's extraordinary. He's, he was saying this in the debates I had with him in 1998, in the last century. That sounds an awful long time ago. He was saying this in 1999. He was even saying this in 2014. What was fascinating to me what, uh, was when you go, when you look at that debate and you see what he was trying to do, I was coming up with six different manuscripts that didn't agree with each other. Uh, There's the Topkapi, the Samarkand, the Ma'il, the Husseini, the Petropolis, and the Sana'a manuscript. I gave those six at that time. He would had not even looked at those six manuscripts. Though he has been, he has been on, uh, uh, he's been quoted, you can go see him on video, uh, where he talks about the Samarkand, he talks about the Ma'il, and I think he talks about the Topkapi. Those three, he says, are exactly the same that we have today. They are all complete. There is no changes whatsoever. When he was shown this in, in front of 700 people, now about 500,000 people have watched that debate. When he was shown this and could not respond to it, except with this lame excuse of the number 19, the miracle of the number 19, that's all he could come back with. It seems that, that the Muslims have really hammered him on this because he's not able to really respond any better than that. And I think this video that was put out a week ago uh, is to try to... Uh, uh, Oh, uh, understand how you deal with the, the the compilation of the Quran from Al Buhari. Are, are you familiar with Al Buhari, Volume Six, Five Hundred Nine, Five Ten? Okay, and here they are, right here. I've got them right here. Here is Al Buhari, Volume uh, Six, Five Hundred Nine, and here is Al Buhari, Volume Six, Five Ten. These are the two. It's just these two pages. Anybody who wants to know how the Quran is put together, you'd need to go to here, including Shabinari. And it seems to me what he was doing in that video was trying to understand what Bukhari was saying, trying to redact it back onto the seventh century, and he made error after error after error. One of the first things I noticed is that he wanted to make sure that we only spent our time looking at the recitation. The recitation is all that he talked about. He kept on pushing back to what we know as the kira'at and the akhruf uh, difficulty. Now, are you familiar with these terms, are, are you not, Robert? Yes. Okay. The kira'at, the akhruf, these, how would you define kira'at and akhruf? Oh, I'm sorry. Wait a minute. What are you referring to? I apologize. Sorry. The kira'at and the ahruf, the, the harf. The harf are the letters, uh, the the readings. Uh, the whole kira'at well, I thought literature. you were talking about something else altogether. I'm okay. sorry. All right. Sorry. I should have. And I, I, didn't, I didn't warn you that I was going to get into the, the kira'at. No, the I'm not, I cannot tell you about these. Go ahead. Okay, these are basically the diacritical uh, differences. The diacritical marks. Oh, that I, yeah, that I got. The, okay. I'm very familiar with them. 
All right. And you know that all of these dire critical marks were only in, introduced in the 8th century to the late 8th century. Yeah, absolutely. The okay. earliest manuscripts don't have any of them. And it's extraordinary. I discussed this at great length in the book, actually, that right. uh, the, a lot of the variations come from different places to put the diacritical marks. And of course, there's the famous story of the kid who says the, uh, there's no oil in it because the word for oil is the same as the word for error if you change the diacritical marks. And of course, all of Luxembourg's work depends on that as well, that the, uh, if you were take, take out, strip out the diacritical marks, you can read the Quran in an entirely different way as an Aramaic text. Okay, and that's exactly what is happening in the 8th and 9th century, where we had about 37 different renditions of how to read this text. Now that the dots were in place, now that the three vowels had been invented, the Dhamma, the Kasara, and the Fatta, now that you had those three vowels in place, the short and the long, not the long <laughs> one yet, that then created all kinds of problems because uh, we've, we've just collected, um, uh, my good uh, colleague and friend, Hatun Tosh, has collected 37 of these Kira'at that are you can buy in the in the, uh, the marketplaces in places like Yemen, Jordan, and in Morocco, and looking just at twenty three of those kira'at, of those schools, you might say of thought, all with a name on them that is the person who actually wrote it. We've come up with ninety three thousand differences. Can you see the difficulty right there? Now, what Shabin Ali was doing all the way through the video, he was referring to that, but he was bringing that which is there in, uh, let's put it this way, that which is there in the ninth century, he was redacting it back to the seventh century and saying that this problem that existed in the ninth century or the late eighth century was actually what Uthman was dealing with in the mid seventh century. What's the problem with that? And why I can see you smiling because you can see there's a difficulty in that. Well, there's no indication that... Uh... I mean, in the first place, it's contradictory to the entire traditional story because Uthman is supposed to have collected all the variants and burned them okay. and settled on one right canonical there. text. When you burn variants, are you burning people's oral recitation? No, clearly not. <laughs> can you see, right? How can you burn someone's voice? How can you burn someone's recitation? You're burning something that creates carbon, right? But With also, if you're, if, you're, if you're establishing a written text at the time of Uthman, then the people who are giving the text orally have to uh, go back to the new written text and refer to it. And okay. if they have variants in their oral recitation, then they are now reciting it wrong. Yeah. So and, it doesn't work. And how do you know they're reciting it wrong? What do you go to as a standard? Well, you have to go to the written text. The written text. You and so if it's, this is the problem with Shabir is that it doesn't, his explanation does not work with the traditional canonical story of the formulation of the Quran. These two pages are hanging him. And this is why, you know, in some ways, it's so good we have al-Buhari written down. Although al-Buhari makes mistakes, understandably, he thinks that you can uh, write that there are differences in the written text in a, 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 a what, what he calls, uh, not a language, but a, um, uh, what's the word here? When you have different languages, um, uh, if I got the name right off the head, dialects. He thinks that these are dialectical differences. Now, here, let me ask you, are, are, are you familiar with Arabic? I don't know if you are or not, Robert, so I don't want to ask. Not very much, to some degree. But do you know, you do know, and from what this discussion we we're just having, in order to have a different dialect in a written text, you need to have vowels. You yeah, need to have course, the yeah. Okay, so in order to write down a different dialect, so he said, there you have Uthman saying to Zaidi bin Tabid, along with Zabir Alas and Hisham, that there, the four of them are to write it in the Qureshi dialect. How mm -hmm. could you write it in a Qureshi dialect if there's no Dhamma, Fatah, and Kasra to distinguish between one dialect in a written text? You can right. speak it in a different dialect, but you cannot have it written down. Right. You see, that's a problem right there. Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. I mean, okay. uh, I don't really know what to say to add to that. The problem is that Arabic very clearly... Uh, the earliest texts do not have this, these elements in them, and so uh, they can be. It can be taken in any number of ways. But your your point about the dialects is absolutely right. This is this is 
Well, I would say that this is one of the glaring errors of Al Buhari. Buhari is talking about his own times. Remember when he died, 870. So he's in the late mm -hmm. ninth century. He's referring to what he thinks is the problem in the ninth century. Because yeah. in the ninth century, there would be, because that's by the eighth century, by the late end century, you have 37 of these different dialectical sure. differences written in completely different texts. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, I don't have it here in front of me. She has this graph that she puts up uh, where she looks at that. And when you look at all the different names and look at the dates, they're all 8th century. And they are all here, the different ones that we're talking about. These are the just 26 of those that we have in our possession. She's up to 37 of them. And every one of them has a different dialectical, a different constant, not a constant, a different dialectical difference yeah. uh, that separates them. That would have been well known in the ninth century. Al Buhari is talking about something but that makes sense. You can't have that before you have the vowels. There you go. So he's redacting it back. He didn't know his history. He didn't know his Arabic. And sure. that's why there's a huge glaring error. And Shabit Ali hasn't picked up on that. And there are a number of problems of that kind in the in the Islamic literature that don't aren't just restricted to the Quran itself. Uh, one of the ones that you know we were talking about before we did any of the either of these videos that we didn't get to, as I recall. Did we talk about the leap months? No, we didn't get into that. So this is the same thing. So you did thing. say something very clearly uh, about the <clears throat> Lehman. Go ahead, go ahead and repeat it because you did talk about that ten days ago. Oh, I'm sorry. I no, say it don't again. recall it's having done it's so. But uh, it, it Muhammad in, in chapter nine of the Quran, or whoever wrote chapter nine of the Quran, forbids leap months to uh, bring the lunar calendar into line with the solar calendar, which the Arab pre-Islamic Arabic calendar had. And so uh, that's why the Islamic festivals move through the year because the uh, lunar calendar is shorter than the solar calendar. Mm -hmm. But in all the Hadith literature, we have Muhammad doing all kinds of things at all kinds of times. And Ibn Ishaq notes in the Sira, uh, the dates of all this material, nothing ever is done during the leap months, which indicates that when it was written, uh, which is actually before Bukhari, they didn't know that leap months had existed. They'd forgotten all about them. <laughs> Not that... Uh, Muhammad just took 30 days off every year or every okay. few years. Now, listen, I, we have gone way over time. I'm going to be doing putting up a video tomorrow uh, because we've only talked really about the first three minutes of that video. There's another 10 minutes that I really wanted to get into. I'm going to be putting a video up looking at the last 10 minutes and the errors that uh, Shabit Ali made. And they think the elephant in the room that he doesn't want to talk about. And the big elephant in the room is he doesn't want to talk about this earliest manuscript. He doesn't want to talk about the Uthmanic recension. He doesn't want to talk about Abu Bakr's recension that was given to Hafsa, the daughter of Umar, supposedly, according to traditions left under her bed, you've got to go back to the textual history. You've got to go back to the manuscripts themselves. And you've got to ask, why is it that these manuscripts are not from the time of Uthman? No one say, agrees anymore that they're from Uthman. We can't find any complete manuscript at all of the Quran from the 7th century or the 8th century or the 9th century. We're not even sure we can find a complete manuscript in one in its form from the 10th century. But let these me make sure I understand you. Are you talking when you speak about, uh, I have material in the book about Hafsa's uh, Quran and the other various, the Zayd ibn Tabit and all the rest of it, uh, the various people who supposedly collected it all together. But are you saying that there are actually identifiable manuscript traditions that can go back, be traced back to those people? No. Because it seems to me that they were all invented later to explain away various variations in the Qurans uh, that and the stories of Muhammad also that different so, parties had. And in some ways, this is a good way to end off. What we're saying about the Quran, we're also saying about Muhammad. Just as the questions concerning who is this Muhammad we're looking at, the Muhammad we're looking at, the traditional Muhammad is nothing more than Muhammad of faith. And he is an amalgamation, as you say, of many different traditions that we're finding taken and put down. And I have no difficulty believing that Balbuadi had 600,000 of these stories. Oh, yeah. He them down to 7,397, threw out 99% of it, only retained that which fit his narrative. And that's mm -hmm. the that's the, the nine volumes we have today. And None even that is full of contradictions. Absolutely. Because his criteria did not exclude contradictions. Uh, they, they were only based on the spurious ways to determine authenticity. And within those 
traditions are also these stories about the Quran. In the same yeah. way that Muhammad had to be concocted, the Quran had to be concocted. And the oh, story yeah. about the Quran had to be concocted. And that's why you have this famous reference there in volume 6, 509 and 510 that is riddled with problems, but that Shabir Ali has to hold to and has to somehow try to explain. And I'm so glad I'm not in his shoes. I'm so glad we're not. We don't have what he has to do. Thank God for our Bible. Isn't it a great book, Robert? We don't have yes. these problems with the Bible. Isn't Absolutely. it great that we have it? We don't have these problems with our Lord Jesus Christ. It's also noteworthy that uh, even with all the textual questions that uh, arise in regard to the Bible, you can ask them. Uh, yeah. He has to tread very carefully because if he goes too far over the line, he could be threatened with death by his co-religionists, yeah, whereas uh, biblical scholars have never worried about such a thing. No, this is the freedom we have. And listen, Robert, it's always enjoy talking with you. Uh, you, uh, you. Likewise. You and I, we're very much on the same plane. We're doing much of the same type of material. We're working the same area. Uh, it's a blessing to have you come on board. Thanks for your time. I know we're under pandemic. Yeah, I'm sorry that a couple times my memory is faulty here, and I do have to get you. Uh, what was it I'm going to get you? I'm going to get it to you right away. You can oh, talk about uh, when Muhammad first appears as Muhammad. Yes. I, want you to I don't think me. it's necessarily... Uh, at the time of Abdul Malik and Hajjaj, certainly though that was the linchpin for the formulation. Okay, you have made that uh, publicly clear that it's not Abdul Malik. I say it is, so I want to hear what you're going to say. Where then? I'm going to ask you: Is it either 692 when he put it on the coins, or is it 696 when he when he took off his own image and re and had only the script there? I'd like to hear what you say on that. I'll be waiting for you. You may convince me. Let's see if you convince everybody else. God okay. bless. You too. This, Thank you. This has been terrific. It's been a great time. We'll, we'll come again. We'll do another topic. But what we're going to do is we're probably going to take more specific topic and, we, and keep it down to that so that we can uh, manage it a little bit more better because we're kind of going okay. off a lot of different tragics, uh, trajectories. Well, there's so much that can be said about all of this. We could we could do 10 of these. Well, I can't imagine a better, a better man than you doing. You just amaze me with a wealth of, of not only knowledge, but the way you're so eloquent in putting it together. <laughs> That's very kind of you to say after so many memory lapses today, but uh, I appreciate it. <laughs> they weren't that bad. You did a good job. God bless you. Listen, everybody else, thank you. Get your comments there. Uh, I will be putting up this video tonight or tomorrow morning uh, sometime on looking and seeing what Shabin Ali forgot to say and what he needs to say and what we're waiting for. These elephants in the room that need to be exposed, that he needs to have it we need to have an answer for him if he is willing to go as far as saying yes there are variants uh, but these are nothing substantial they don't change any doctrine they don't change any belief they don't change any practice he made that very patently clear all the way through the video i would suggest that he hasn't answered the million dollar question and that is what about the manuscripts forget about the kid forget about the Ahruf. that's the eighth and ninth century i want to talk about the seventh century i want to bring him back kicking and screaming back to the time of Muthman, mid seventh century and ask him what exactly happened then? Where is that manuscript? And why is it we can't even find one? Okay, God bless you. This has been terrific having Robert with us. Robert, until the next time, this is Jay and Robert over and out. Thank you.